Okay, now we come to the part of the program where I have to say something. It reminds me of, you know, whenever you fly to Japan, right, and you're getting ready to land and then they say, Otsukari sama deshita, right? But you still have to do like immigration and all that junk, right? This is the immigration part, okay? Okay. Uh, my primary purpose in giving this presentation is to provide uh, brief comments on each of the papers of this symposium, with the exception of John's, uh, because what can you say after John's? Um, I will save some time uh, at the end for my own observations on, on this topic, but please keep in mind that I'm not an expert on parades, processions, let alone Tokugawa parades or processions. Okay, so Professor Kudoshima's paper first. Professor Kudoshima uh, demonstrates the extent to which the parades and processions of Tokugawa Japan can give historians insight into different aspects of Tokugawa society, especially attitudes towards those involved in the processions themselves. <clears throat> he argues that the presence in the case of Ryukyu and Korea, or the absence in the case of the Dutch of Chiso, what he calls reception, indicates the ways in which the Edo Bakfu viewed its relationships to foreign cultures. Ronald Toby argues that the decline of the Ming Dynasty in 1644 fueled the development of a Japan-centered world order, the fundamental structure for which the Japanese borrowed from the Chinese, namely the tributary system. At nearly the same time, the custom of Sanking Kotai was taking shape, developing from a voluntary display of loyalty to the shogun to a mandatory one. These parallel developments converged in the practices associated with processions as those of foreign envoys bolstered this Japan-centered world order and those of the daimyo reinforced the political reality of Tokugawa dominance. This convergence also served to elide in the minds of those paying close attention, and as we all know, that doesn't happen all the time, the Edo Bakfu with Japan, so that the processions of foreign envoys were both a display of respect for the Bakfu and also for Japan, while Sanking Kotai fostered an image of political and even cultural unity. Professor Kudoshima observes how the Dutch were treated less well than the Koreans and the Ryukyuans, uh, less well than the Koreans and the Ryukyuans because the Dutch were not viewed as guests of the Edo Bakfu. <clears throat> Although the Ryukyuans were guests, their participation in the pro procession to Edo was not exactly by choice, unlike the Koreans. The Dutch were in Japan for purposes of trade and so they were ineligible for Chiso despite the fact that they engaged in processions of their own to Edo. Beginning in 1853, the Americans arrived in Japan, also with trade in mind. Following the Treaty of Kanagawa, they had permission to trade just like the Dutch, with the exception that they were not required to conduct their business in Nagasaki. What impact, if any, did the so-called opening of Japan have on the practice of processions? Tokugawa Iemochi's procession of Kyoto in 1863 came the year after the requirements for Sanking Kotai were relaxed by the Bakfu, so that the imperative to proceed fell on the shogun himself rather than on the daimyo. One way to view this, his procession is to juxtapose its image of power and authority against the image of Bakfu weakness that developed in the aftermath of the unequal treaties with the West. Now, Professor Smiths. <clears throat> Professor Smiths argues very convincingly if for a shift in the Ryukyuan attitude toward China following Satsuma's invasion in 1609. Under direction from Satsuma and also from the Edo Bakfu, Ryukyu was required to make every effort to maintain its status as a tributary state of the then waning Ming Dynasty. Although this trade was not as lucrative as the Satsuma and Bakfu leaders had hoped, it was still a vital conduit uh, of Chinese trade goods, and it gave the Bakfu access to China in a way that circumvented the need for the Bakfu to become a part of the tributary system. The Ryukyuans had to be mindful to hide the true nature of their relationship to Satsuma and to the Bakfu, even if these efforts devolved into ritualistic farce. At the same time, cultural sinification was another way for the Ryukyuans to maintain close ties with the Chinese by creating a quote-unquote good, good impression. While all of the specific ways that the Ryukyuans used to do this that Professor Smith mentioned in his talk are all valid, it is important to remember that the Ryukyuans wanted to make a good impression on the Satsuma officials as well by showing the degree to which they had mastered Japanese cultural and artistic forms, such as ikebana and the tea ceremony. Professor Smith likens the ceremonies associated with investiture that were undertaken on Okinawa during the visits 
of Chinese investiture, investitures official, officials as a kind of parade in the sense that the Ryukyuans wanted literally to put on a good show, a fact to which the origins of Kumi Udui attest. In addition to this functional equivalent, equivalent of a parade, the Ryukyuan envoys that journeyed to Edo as either Keigashi or Shaolinshi were critical to the success of actual processions, and the impression that they left with the Japanese people was both a lasting and positive one. Anyone going to Shuri Castle today cannot avoid the crowds that gather around the famous Shuremon Gate. The gate itself dates to the 1530s, and its famous inscription or hengaku, Shure no Kuni, means something like the realm that observes ritual, a phrase attributed to the Ming Emperor Wan Li in praise of Ryukyu, dates to a few decades after the reign of King Shou'e. In other words, both the gate and its inscription date to the period prior to the Satsuma invasion. The Hengaku was displayed on the gate only during the stay of the Chinese investiture officials. Once they left, it was taken down. King Shou Shitsu, who reigned from 1648 to 1668, ordered that the Hengaku remain on the gate permanently, and thereafter the gate became known as the Shuremon. Uh, by the way, the Shuremon is on the 2,000 yen bill. So if anyone has a 2,000 yen bill on them, you can take a look at it. Prior to the Satsuma invasion, the gate and its hengaku were displayed by Ryukyu and kings as a proud accomplishment in recognition of their efforts to adopt Chinese cultural institutions for the consumption of their Chinese guests. After 1609, especially after the hengaku was made permanent, it functioned more as a goal, both for the consumption of their Chinese guests and also for their Japanese overlords. Now, Professor Yokoyama. <clears throat> Professor Yokoyama observes how Japanese commoners of the Edo period developed a rather positive image of Ryukyu via the Keigashi and Shaunshi processions and their graphic representations, especially those that were published. This image of Ryukyu carried over into the modern period, and it was one of the likely factors behind the Meiji state's annexation of Ryukyu in 1879. During the Edo period, this positive image of Ryukyu developed alongside the adoption and use of Ryukyuan items by the Japanese people in their everyday lives, and the transformation of the, shan, of the sanshin into the shamisen might be one of the more prominent examples of this. Since the depictions of Ryukyuan and Korean processions were very nearly the same, did a similarly friendly image of Korea develop during the Edo period? Did the Tokugawa Japanese adopt and use Korean items as they had Ryukyuan ones? Despite the requirement that the Ryukyuan envoys had to look as foreign as possible, did the people of Tokugawa Japan still see the Koreans as somehow more foreign than the Ryukyuans? By drawing on the notions of cultural hierarchy implicit within the Chinese, cult, uh, the Chinese tributary system, the Edo Bakfu was able to project an image of power and authority by receiving foreign envoys, whether it was the Koreans, the Ryukyuans, or even the Dutch. As Toby has famously argued, foreign relations played a critical role in the Edo Bakfu's efforts to prove its pol political legitimacy, a task that was especially important during the early decades of the 17th century. Whether the Koreans, the Ryukyuans, or the Dutch were actually impressed by this image, which they had a hand in creating, of course, was less important to the Edo Bakfu than the effect that it had on Tokugawa society as a whole. In other words, the processions of foreign envoys functioned ideologically in a way that was accessible and comprehensible to anyone who saw them or even heard of them. Thus, the fact that the Edo Bakfu had to maintain foreign relations, even during an era when it was otherwise closed uh, off from the outside world, was in and of itself insufficient to produce the desired ideological effect of political legitimation. Processions were the very embodiment of the Edo Bakfu's foreign relations, and the best means of conveying that fact to a large swath of the country and to nearly all levels of Tokugawa society. The popular esteem for Ryukyu, it would seem, was an unintended consequence of this ideological performance. Were the leaders of the Edo Bakfu at all concerned with the growing fondness among the Tokugawa Japanese for Ryukyu and culture? Did these attitudes somehow facilitate the larger ideological message inherent in the processions themselves? Now move on to Travis's presentation. Mr. Seifman cautions us against reading too much into the analysis of graphic, graphic representations of Ryukyu and processions. Analysis of, this, of these representations <clears throat> can yield a great deal of information, and Mr. Seifman masterfully demonstrated this in his presentation, but we should be aware of the limitations inherent in using them as primary sources. He notes how the Ryukyu and envoys were dressed in decidedly foreign garb, but he questions the prevailing interpretation among historians 
that the Ryukyuans were forced by the leaders of Satsuma, perhaps in league with Bakfu officials, to do this. He suggests that it was possible that the Ryukyuans themselves had some agency in the selection of their clothing so that their Ryukyuan and or Chinese appearance uh, may have seemed more a matter of choice than sartorial imperative. This is the kind of question that even a very close analysis of a graphic representation of a, of a Ryukyuan procession cannot begin to address. Mr. Seifman astutely, astutely pointed out how the use of the kago and the horse in Ryukyuan depictions seem inverted by comparison with their Sankin Kotai counterparts. Specifically, the daimyo who proceeded either to or from Edo as part of their Sankin Kotai processions preferred to make the journey on horseback rather than as a passenger in a kago, as Mr. Seifman, citing Constantine Vaporis, argues, uh, argues that travel via the latter was not as comfortable as the former. In the case of the Ryukyuan processions, high-ranking officials seem to have traveled via kago, while their lower-ranking colleagues made the trip on horseback. This situation would seem to be the inversion of Sankin Kotai, since the daimyo was almost certainly the highest-ranking person in any Sankin Kotai procession. Yet horseback seemed to have been the transportation mode of choice rather than the kago. If this is the case, I would, I would like to offer a potential explanation, namely that the daimyo preference for the horse may have had more to do with the maintenance of a proper military appearance rather than it did matters of comfort. And if the two happen to coincide, all the better. It may be more difficult, uh, may have been more difficult to project the requisite image of warrior leadership while hidden inside a kago. After all, that's what those, you know, Kuge would have done, right? right. Uh, by the same token, having high-ranking officials from Yuku on horseback may have projected an overly martial image that conflicted with the model of civilian authority then prevalent in China, a model that the Ryukyuans constantly sought to emulate. The preference among high-ranking Ryukyuan officials for the kago over the horse may have symbolized the ideal hierarchy of civilian authority over military authority, a hierarchy that the Japanese began to reverse in the 12th and 13th centuries, and a process that was completed far in advance of the 17th century. OK, now. So now the plane has landed, and you've already turned in your immigration. Now you're in line for immigration. Okay? <laughs> now I'm going to give you my observations. I have two general comments to make on the subject of proce processions in early modern Japanese history. The first deals with evolving perceptions of foreignness by the Tokugawa Japanese, and the other is related to the ways in which these foreign interactions influenced Tokugawa society. The word which is universally used to signify foreign country is gaikoku, and foreigner, gaikokujin, or more commonly gaijin, uh, is one of the first words we learn when we study Japanese. A more literal translation of gaikoku would be something like external realms or realms on the outside, translations which betray Japanese assumptions regarding foreignness, namely that the Western binaries of foreign domestic or foreign native are different from the analogous Japanese binaries of internal, external, or inside, outside. Although the usage of gaikoku is so ubiquitous in Japan today, the provenance of the term is likely quite ancient when its cognate totsukuni was used to refer to provinces outside of the Kinai region. Similarly, the word tozama was used to refer to daimyo during the Muromachi period, whose lands fell outside of the provinces controlled either directly or indirectly by the Ashikaga. And its utility was such that it was adopted by the Tokugawa shoguns to refer to those great lords whose power represented any kind of challenge to their own. While a binary of center periphery was certainly at work in the ways in which totsukuni was understood in Japanese antiquity, this, function, this binary functioned in even more robust ways during the Edo period, when all daimyo were required to undertake their Sankin Kotai processions to and from Edo. Indeed, the power and authority of the shogun was enhanced in more profound ways when one analyzes Sankin Kotai as the practice of manifesting both the shogun's political centrality as well as his position on the inside, in an analogous position to that of the emperor in the Kinai that the concept of totsukuni was intended to evoke. Citing the work of Bito Masahide, Ron Tobi has argued that the decline of the Ming Dynasty inspired some Japanese Confucians, notably Yamazaki Anzai, Yamagasoko, and Asami Keisai, to claim the title of Chuka, which means central efflorescence, uh, or Chugoku, central realm, uh, for Japan. 
Chugoku, by the way, is the term that we use in Japanese today to refer to China, Chugoku. It is the concept of the center inherent in these terms that undergirded the Chinese tributary system and which honed the semiotic effectiveness of later Japanese concepts like totsukuni and tozama. In fact, one could argue that the Sanking Kotai and foreign envoy processions of the Tokugawa period derive their ceremonial and ritual meanings from the Chinese concept of the center. The practical experience of Chinese imperial authority, its Japanese counterpart, or that of the Tokugawa shogun, began from their conceptual positions of centrality, which was created and recreated via processions of peoples. For Yamaga Soko, this 17th century Japanese Confucian, Japan did not simply displace China from the center. It was always at the center, despite the fact that no one seemed to have recognized this fact. For Soko, the proof of this fact was fundamentally cosmological and geographical. Writing in 1669, he states, quote, the earth is in the center of the heavens. The center is bounded by the four directions. Thus, it is the center. The central realm means the realm in the center of heaven and earth. What does the center of heaven and earth mean? It means that the seasons change as they should, and there are no extremes of cold or heat, and its land and people are both very beautiful. There are many realms in the world, but only the central realm, and he means Japan, and the outer imperial realm, by which he meant China, are in the center of heaven and earth." End quote. In this passage, Soko uses the name central realm to refer to Japan, and outer imperial realm, or gaicho, to refer to China, a term that resonates with gaikoku and totsukuni. Citing its geographic position in particular, Soko believed that Japan's climate and natural environment made it superior to China so that referring to Japan as the central realm was naturally fitting and appropriate. The significance of Japan's centrality was of cosmic proportions for Soko. Uh, for the Confucians, the concept of the center, uh, chu or naka, uh, was foundational both for their metaphysical view of the world and their moral teachings which grew out of it. It would not be an exaggeration to say that the center made a Confucian epistemology possible. Rather than analyze the link between Confucian epistemology and a concept of the center, Jacques Derrida has examined the ways in which the center makes meaning possible in a Western context. See, the immigration line gets longer. <laughs> he observed how the Western esteem for structural thinking, which gave rise in the, modern era, in the modern era to Marxism and to structuralism, betrayed a structural character all its own, one that needed a concept of the center in order to function. Quote, structure, or rather the structurality of structure, although it has always been at work, has always been neutralized or reduced, and this by a process of giving it a center or of referring to it a point of reference, a fixed origin. The function of this center was not only to orient, balance, and organize the structure, one cannot in fact conceive of an unorganized structure, but above all to make sure that the organizing principle of the structure would limit what we might call the play of the structure. By orienting and organizing the coherence of the system, the center of the structure permits the play of its elements inside the total form. And even today, the notion of a structure lacking any center represents the unthinkable itself." End quote. Derrida, of course, did not seek to praise such an epistemology so much as to indicate how it operated to produce meanings that seemed fixed and inviolable, such that the destabilization of meaning could only be accomplished via play, specifically the play of the signifier. However, this, his observations about the center apply equally well, I believe, to the Confucian concept of the center, which was also intended to produce epistemological stability and make signification possible. The chief difference between the two concepts of center is that the Confucians overtly assigned a series of signifieds to the center signifier, of which China itself was one. In the Western tradition, there is seemingly no signified for the center. It is function without substance. As Derrida pointed out in his writings, a concept with no signified yet from which emerged the unproblematic couplings of signifiers and signifieds was itself a kind of signified that transcended all others. It was the transcendental signified. Among the attempts to come to grips with the transcendental signified in the Western tradition, Derrida observed, uh, was God, uh, God itself. Derrida's identification of logocentrism made the connection between the concept of the center and God, while Confucian scholars in East Asia had long made the association between the center and the cosmos a foundational part of their teachings. While the utility of gaikoku in modern parlance is clear, it had to share space during the Edo period with another word with a similar meaning, yet which evoked a different set of binaries, ikoku. Uh, 
The word ikoku can be rendered as different realm or exotic realm, translations which produce binaries such as exotic, familiar, and different same. By referring to the processions of the Koreans, the Ryukyuans, and maybe even the Dutch, the peoples, uh, they refer to these peoples as ikoku. The ideological emphasis on the political and ritualistic centrality of the Edo Bakfu converged with an emerging sense of cultural sameness on the part of those viewing the processions, whether in person or in not. In other words, these processions had the effect, perhaps unintended, of creating images of nation and ethne at the same time, making the task of distinguishing the two very difficult. In a complementary way, the Sankin Kuotai processions reinforced these images on nearly a constant basis for more than 200 years, since political centralization was the very raison d'etre for Sankin Kuotai in the first place. Moreover, the residency requirement in Edo for daimyo and their families contributed to the awareness of belonging to a common ethne, which the development of an Edo dialect of Japanese facilitated to a great degree. The 17th century designation of Korea and Ryukyu as ikoku, and likely the Portuguese and the Spanish in the 16th century, endured until the end of the Edo period. The utility of ikoku as a general designation for foreign countries was such that Sakamoto Ryoma used it to refer to the United States and to the Americans in the 1850s and 1860s. In a very famous letter to his father, which he brushed shortly after the arrival of Commodore Matthew Perry uh, and the US Navy in 1853, Ryoma refers to the Americans as the people of an ikoku several times. Quote, concerning my brother's rumor about America having just arrived, you can judge for yourself. First of all, regarding this urgent matter before us, though you may have had a hard time with my hasty and messy handwriting, <laughs> How can we avoid uh, dealing with these foreign ships? I know that by next spring, the numbers of foreigners will have grown. He's talking about Americans. I am certain that foreign ships will keep coming to Japan, which means that foreign armies will soon follow. When that time comes, I will take me some foreign heads and return home with them." End quote. What is significant in Byoma's late Tokugawa usage of ikoku was not the commonalities he saw between the Americans and the Koreans and the Ryukyuans, but the commonalities he believed existed among the Japanese people. While ikoku functioned as a signifier of difference, the effect it produced was a signification of cultural sameness. My final observation regarding processions is related to the ways in which nativism is understood in the field of anthropology. One of the seminal works in the area of what I call anthropological nativism is Ralph Linton's 1943 article, Nativistic Movements. In this essay, Linton describes the arrival of colonizers and their interactions with the natives as paradigmatic for the emergence of nativism. In these encounters, the culture of the colonizers influences cultural developments among the colonized, and the cultural institutions of the colonized have a similar influence on the attitudes of the colonizers, and he labels these developments and attitudes as comprising nativism. In the case of processions, we see a similar interaction between foreigner arrivals and the natives with the exception that the former are not bent on the colonization of the latter. In fact, the power dynamic is reversed between the context of these foreigner envoy processions and the case of nativism, as Linton's colonial paradigm operates on the assumption that foreigner arrivals have more technological and military prowess than the natives do, while this was certainly not the case with the foreigner envoy processions of the Tokugawa period. Rather than argue that these processions represented instances within which nativistic attitudes emerged among the Japanese, I believe that the images of authority and paternalism which they evoked, one at the behest of the Edo Bakfu and the other among the commoners who viewed them, were different aspects of the same phenomenon, namely exceptionalism. As one Americanist has observed, exceptionalism is a way of thinking based on ideas of either a nation's exempt status or its exemplary status. A nation is exceptional when it is, when it is exempt from forces that otherwise affect all other nations. It is also exceptional when it is qualitatively exemplary in ways that other Asian nations are not, in other words, superior. It is easier to make a case for exceptionality when one's nation is the recipient of foreign processions and exempt from having to undertake them, and this was the case with China and its tributary states, of which Ryukyu was one. By not submitting to this tributary system, the Edo Bakfu was able to foster an image of itself and of Japan as exceptional, by virtue of an exemption from the Chinese tributary system. At the same time, the very reasons for undertaking the journeys to pay homage either to the Chinese emperor or to the shogun could be construed as a recognition of that nation's cultural superiority. 
an observation that Toby made regarding the Edo Bakfu's need to maintain at least some level of foreign relations with the outside world. Consequently, rather than fostering one type of exceptionalism over the other, that is to say, exempt or exemplary, these foreigner envoy processions derived their ideological power from both. Much the same could be said of China and its tributary system, such that, the, such that Japanese exceptionalism during the Tokugawa period must be examined alongside China's. One could say that the strength of Japan, Japanese efforts to prove Japan's exceptionality was likely inversely proportional to that of the Chinese. And this could be a reason why these foreigner envoy processions were as prominent as they were during the Tokugawa period. Thank you.